because he is sitting. All right, yeah. This is, this is the, uh, the future, sitting for prone lateral here. Um, so uh, if we can switch the camera over to um, the view behind me so we can just kind of see how the patient's positioned. So, um, so right here, the, this is uh, rostral, this is caudal. Um, this is the special um, positioner uh, that fits on the Jackson table. You'll see these little knobs here. So uh, kind of like what Bill alluded to earlier, you get some coronal adjustment with this uh, system. You have these pads here that would have straps uh, that are available. So you can do get a little coronal tilt, kind of open up the space here. Um, and then we have our uh, retractor arm that we're gonna use in a second. And um, I've marked out the patient here. So um, I still do this with fluoro. Um, and uh, so we can see kind of like an old fashioned way of doing this where I've pre-marked the uh, vertebral body. Uh, here's roughly the midline um, and then the, the posterior border of the body, anterior border of the body. And we have an oblique incision kind of like this. Uh, maybe two and a half, three centimeters is, is all you really need. And um, uh, so here we're gonna do L3, L4, um, and uh, we'll show you uh, one of the ways of doing the prone lateral. I think it'll be great since we have uh, Bill showing us the PTP later, so I'm sure he does it better than I do. So it's good to, good to see multiple ways of doing the same procedure here. So, all right, I'll take the knife. Let's make our incision. Something like that. Yeah, so since we're in a cadaver, we'll just kind of go down sharply for the sake of time. So really what we're getting down to the, the muscle layer here where we're gonna identify the external oblique. Let me take that. And then we'll, we'll bluntly, uh, I guess the lighting's not the best on that. So. Uh, basically, we're, we're looking for the muscle fiber. Uh, is there a way that, yeah, that light's kind of in the camera. Yeah, that's better. So we'll kind of just d divide here. Yeah, that's better. And then at some point, you'll see the, the fibers cross, and then, then you know you're in your internal oblique. So you can see the fibers there. And then in most people, the transverse abdominis is a fairly wimpy kind of structure. And you can kind of just penetra um, go through that layer just with the tip of your finger. So you'll feel it pop through. And basically now here I'm in the retroperitoneal space. So, um, so here palpating posteriorly, kind of mobilizing the peritoneum uh, uh, ventrally. And here I can palpate, this is probably the L4, uh, spinous process here. If you reach down for you can hear, feel the iliacus. And then um, if I go straight down, that's, good, that's gonna be the psoas in the lateral border of the vertebral body. So and then we'll just kind of make sure we have enough um, of an opening there in the fascia so we're not fighting it. Okay, so I'll take the dilator. And so we're in a cadaver, so we don't, we don't have the EMG to demonstrate, but you know, you're gonna wanna do this uh, with EMG guidance. And so why don't you go ahead and uh, flip to a lateral, uh, Shelley? And so one of the things I uh, wanna highlight is the, for the patient positioning, it's, it's definitely more familiar doing a prone lateral um, in terms of your positioning, because that's what we're used to doing for posterior lateral. Uh, one of the things that you want to make sure you have is a straight orthogonal view, uh, or, or at least the orientation of the spine. So if you can show the, the floral image, um, so here you can see, this is what um, I show the residents. When we're positioning, basically you want to see the spinous process nicely centered, uh, symmetrically between the two pedicles. Uh, luckily in this case, uh, L3-4 is a pretty uh, healthy looking disc space, so it should be not too, too difficult to dock. Um, you know, probably in a, in a real patient, you'd have more pathology, so, but here, just for sake of the demonstration, I think uh, hopefully it works in our favor. Um, so, okay, let's take a lateral now. Okay, so you can see uh, we're a little bit high here, so just kind of walk ourselves down here. Shot there. Okay. 
shot there. Okay, so here we're about in the middle of the disk space here, shot there. Shot. Okay, so, um, and then here at this step we do the, uh, the EMG. Uh, you wanna go and pull this other side. Uh, EMG just to test where we're docking before we, we, we have our jam sheety down. Uh, let's do one more shot. Shot there. So we're right in the middle, so you have a needle driver. And then just a hammer. Go ahead and hammer that down there. Uh, yeah, just on right, right here. Okay, shot. Okay, shot there. So we migrate anterior a little bit, so that's okay. We'll, we'll just back up a little bit. Um, you got that hammer again? So go ahead and just hammer on the needle driver. <clears throat> shot there. Okay, shot there. All right, let me see that hammer. Shot. Oh yeah, it really wants to kick us forward. So I would say, you know, usually getting this wire is probably kind of the, the maybe the uh, most fiddlesome part of the case. I mean, if you're doing it under image guidance, you can imagine how you can skip some of this stuff. Shot there. Shot there. So we'll try docking it a little bit posterior. And again, before you're placing your wire, you'd want to confirm with the EMG that you know, you're in a safe, relatively safe shot there. Relatively safe landing spot. Shot there. Okay, so a little posterior, but I think we can work with it. So here, uh, basically, we would uh, stimulate in all directions, make sure you have good uh, uh, thresholds uh, with the EMG, and then we'll dilate down. Um, go ahead and move north a little bit. Uh, you might want to pull it towards you first. Yeah, go more north. And so, you know, this is a thinner patient, and so uh, you'll probably use a shorter retractor, but here we'll use the 130 just because this is kind of closer to what you might encounter in, in real life. And so again, this is a three by eight retractor. This is the same retractor that, um, you know, at least in this system you would use if you're doing a lateral decubitus. Um, so they have adapted this for the prone lateral uh, uh, workflow. Um, one of the big changes is you have the arm on the ipsilateral side, and instead of kind of pulling the arm up, you're actually, uh, it's more of a, a support from the bottom here. So why don't we go ahead and unlock that guy? And then. Got this driver, and then we'll just kind of dock this on. So we'll leave this loose. All right, come on back with your, your C arm here, Shelly. So I'll just ask you to tighten that in a second. Okay, shot there. Uh, maybe toward the head a little bit more. Shot. So here we're working on trying to get an orthogonal view. Shot there. Uh, in line with the disk space. And it's a little bit challenging when you have the C-arm in this orientation. So oftentimes what I'll do is I, I might have the C-arm on the same side I'm coming, uh, I'm, I'm sitting on, just because you don't get the, um, uh, the, the with, with your field of view with the emitter and where your instrument is. Here it's kind of magnified. Um, shut there. So, does this go up anymore? I'm gonna try. Shut there. That was too much. Shot there. Shot there. No, like that. Shot there. Shot. Oops. Shot there. Okay. Well, maybe if we loosen this a little bit. 
seems kind of, yeah, this, normally that, that would be a little bit higher up, so. Uh, so we'll just adapt it a little bit. Okay, a shot there. Okay, so there you go. So you can see kind of down the barrel of the retractor there. Uh, we'll rotate it so it's in line at this base shot there. So something kind of like that. So go ahead and tighten that. And why don't we save that on and put it on the right. <clears throat> so, I, so, you know, if you look at the back blade, it looks like it might be a little bit uh, posterior, which is kind of how we docked. Um, you know, I, I think you could spend a little bit more time trying to get it right in the middle, but just for the interest of time, we'll, we'll keep moving. So uh, we can make adjustments based on that. So, you know, we have the earlier shot. We know kind of where roughly the gym, uh, where the, uh, the K wire was, which kind of on the, like the 30, 30 yard line. So when we dock the retractor with a shim in a second, uh, we can just be aware of that. So why don't you go toward the, the feet just for a second again. So we'll take out these dilators. Go ahead and take that. So, um, and then now we're gonna wanna get our light source in just so we can kind of see a little bit. Um, and go ahead and go to a, uh, an AP there, Shelley. Oh, yeah. oh, careful there. So in this case, um, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see down here, but in, in this case, you know, the gravity kind of works for us because the retractor is actually drifting uh, anterior a little bit. So we were a little bit posterior with our placement. Um, so I think kind of where this is gonna be, uh, where the retractor is gonna end up is gonna be um, in a pretty good spot. Hey Vic, can you tilt the table away from you a little bit maybe, or is that not something you typically do? Tilt it away or? Yeah, just rotate the patient just so it's more, uh, oh. not, not true supine, but maybe like. Oh, know, well the thing yeah. is that with the table, the, this bolster is on a 15 degree angle. So we've tilted the table so that the patient is uh, supine relative to the ground. Oh, that's what I mean. Can you just make it neutral now? Does just uh, make it more? Well, I think the, uh, the the table itself is uh, the rotation is broken, so it has to be manual. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, that makes it easy. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. Let's take a shot there. Okay. So you can see where our wires in the disc space. So the, the retractor is a little bit pointing uh, cranially. And so we'll, we'll get our shim in and we'll try to, so we can do some uh, of the driver again, do a few adjustments here to, just to kind of get it in the right spot. And then once, once we have the shim in, we'll, we'll get the camera so you can see down the retractor here. And again, here, this is uh, before we place the shim, uh, we we'll do an EMG just to check the, the this again. Uh, you got a hammer. Check check the where the entry point of where where the shim would would go. So let's go shot there. Shot there. So here the shim is uh, you can see the radio peak markers. It's a triangle. So we basically want that lead um, point going into the disc space. That dot there um, and. Uh, and the other thing is looking down in the retractor, we've actually got it pretty close to where the, the wire was. So again, remember the wire was a little bit posterior uh, in the disc space. So I think this will be, work out pretty nicely. Shot there. So you can see the shim going to the disc space, shot there. And then here you have it fully uh, deployed. So let's get the camera down just so we can kind of see down here. So this is a fiber wrapped, uh, can we pull up the Vizion? Do you have the key for it? Let's see, it looks like it's in focus here. Uh, is that the right way? 
That looks better. Okay, here we go. So, you know, th these types of camera systems kind of help with the ergonomics of the procedure just because you can imagine um, having to look down the barrel here for the case. Um, unfortunately for me, I've kind of got a longer torso. So when we first were doing this case, because uh, I was kind of developing this technique, um, you have the driver. Um, you know, like from a workflow ergonomics, it wasn't ideal just because I was kind of bending forward, uh, bending down, and you know, you kind of get a little some fatigue in your shoulders. So here, we're basically pushing these blades anterior, so you can see how uh, you can see the disc space there getting exposed pretty nicely. Uh, there's a little bit of muscle there which we'll dissect off. And here, you know, basically, uh, you know, borrowing from uh, it's two dimensional, but uh, you know, for a lateral, I don't think it matters if you have depth perception or not, because basically you just want to know where you're entering the disc space. So here you can see the disc pretty well. You know, if you're not sure, you can always take a shot, shot there. So you can see kind of where your instrument is in the disc. So it's a pretty large disc there. So let's get the uh, disc knife. And so that becomes more important if you're doing it in a collapsed disc or if there's like a coronal, uh, you know, like a, um, like a coronal deformity where one, one side is collapsed. It can be helpful to know. So here we'll just do a generous annulotomy with a rectangle. And, you know, I think here again, it's kind of like the, you know, learning from our, our endoscopic experts. You know, you're, you're just basically looking at a screen. You're not looking directly at the anatomy and uh, you have to get familiar with working at 2D space. So, you know, for all the young surgeons out there, you know, tell your parents that, you know, when they let you play video games in a little, when you're they're younger, it was really just to kind of help you train to become a, a spine surgeon, right? That's what I tell my parents. So, get some, some disc material. Okay, and, and so, you know, now really the rest of the procedure is kind of like your standard lateral decubitus lateral, so we can kind of power through this. You got straight, the large cup. Um, so we'll get a cob in here. Uh, shot there. And a hammer. So we'll just check our orientation. Shot. What's that? Oh yeah, so the other thing, um, you can't see a uh, shot there. On the opposite side, there's a, there's a back bolster where you put contralaterally. So this basically gives you a backstop that you can hammer against. Um, you know, when, when you start doing these cases in exotic uh, kind of positions, you take for granted gravity and you know, something as mundane as like the bed uh, to serve as a back bolster. So I, I think, shot there. With, with some of these newer um, padding systems that work with a Jackson shut there, it really helps to kind of facilitate this type of procedure. <clears throat> Pituitary. And we'll do the box cutter next. So, and then one of the questions that comes up is like, when, when do you decide to do a prone lateral? So, um, I'll just speak with my own experience. When I first, you know, what made sense to me for doing a prone lateral, it was uh, adjacent level cases or anything where I had to do anything posterior. Uh, I didn't want to do a position change. And, um, and, and that kind of made sense to me uh, as far as why you would adopt it. Um, I think as I've gotten better at it, I, you know, starting to think about it more for, for virgin type cases, you know, so, uh, shot there. <laughs> so if you're doing like a multi-level construct, you know, you don't, in the past you would think about, okay, well, you know, for this disk space, it'd be nice to do this, but then at another disk space, you know, you want to go posterior or you want to go lateral, shot. So here just using this disk box cutter, because uh, it's a pretty healthy disk, so. You know, most may not see this in... So, so Vic, what's your criteria for doing 4-5? I mean, do you look at the LA crest, an AP, lateral, like Bill alluded to, or is there any strict contraindications you have? 
Well, I think that crest is something that you can work around, at least in my hands. Um, for me, the, the bigger consideration is just uh, the, the psoas anatomy and the nerves, because you know the last thing you want to do is like a lung, uh, lumbar plexus injury. You have that cob again? And so, you know, at worst, when you think about a T lift, you know, if you had something catastrophic happen, you take out the L5 nerve root. Shut there. Um, you know, the person, you know, it's not good, great, but they, if they get a foot drop, they can still, they're still ambulatory with that, right? But if you get a femoral nerve injury, then that really changes, that, that's a significant neurological injury. So I think, you know, paying attention to the plexus anatomy, looking at the psoas, you know, recognizing these different transitional, states, um, in the, especially in the, the more distal lumbar spine, is, is uh, important. Hey, uh, Vic, uh, quick question. You know, you're using the box cutter right now. I'm, I'm a big friend of the box cutter. But is there, you know, with collapsed disc spaces, is there a space where you, you're like, you know, I don't want to take the box cutter not to violate the end plate? Or do you always use a box cutter? Uh, well, I only use a box cutter in a case like this where if you look on the floor, it's a pretty big disc. fat disc space. So, um, you know, just kind of, you know, if it's a collapsed disc, I don't know if it's like frozen down here. Shot. If it's like a, if it's a collapsed disc, then, you know, that makes your life easier because you don't really have much in the way of shot. Yeah, something something we're hitting against here. All right, so maybe, let's see the pituitary. So when a collapse disc, it makes, you know, the, the, the disc degeneration has done a, the disc prep for you. So, um, you know, so I, again, yeah, I don't routinely use the box cutter because, you know, the indications were, you know, the cases where you're doing a fusion on a healthy disc like this are gonna be pretty, pretty rare. All right, uh, why don't we get a trial then? So, um, so the other thing that I utilize in my practice is expandable technology. And I think one of the things that it's helpful for is to, oh yeah, it looks like our cadaver's rotating. Um, is just, it kind of minimizes the steps that you need to do for, for trialing. Um, and then we'll, we'll show you the implant in a second here. So, um, so this is a five millimeter trial, a five millimeter height, it's lordotic. Uh, and then we just kind of want to see, A, we want to see shot there, how, how long of an implant that we need. Go a little bit past, shot there. Yeah, so maybe like a 45. Okay, let's take, shot there. Yeah, let's get it in there a little bit. Shot. We'll just kind of go past just to let it sit in here. Uh, why don't we go, let's save that, put it on the right, and then let's go to a lateral now. <clears throat> so with the expandable, um, depending on the, the features, you know, it becomes like a one size fits all. Like all you have to do is determine the, the length of, of the cage that you need. Uh, but you can start at seven millimeters and expand up to 14, and you go from zero degrees lordosis up to, up to 15 degrees. So, uh, I think within that parameters, go ahead. Oop, let's uh, shut there. Oh, uh, we got a little, uh, let's see, you have the lollipop maybe. Hey, uh, Vic, shut one shut. other thing I'm noticing right now, you're right, your face is right next to the x ray emitter. Um, you know, uh, you are at the maximum radiation that you can get in that room right now. Yeah. Um, just, uh, you know, for your, before you up your life insurance here. But, uh, hey, is there any way that you can change it around and sit another side of the Well, so what, what I'll typically do in, uh, in, in uh, my practice is I'll have, I'll have the machine flipped. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty, though, is that when you're doing an AP shot, the technologist has to come in at an angle so that... You basically, like where I'm sitting right now is where the base of the machine would be. Yeah. And then I would sit next to it so I can look directly um, into, into the field. So, uh, but I think just for, you know. No, but in your, so in your practice, you have it flipped around for, for that reason. Uh, sorry, I couldn't, couldn't make in, that. In your, in your practice, you have 
the receiver coil on your side. Correct. In order to avoid that, so you're, you're aware of that yeah. actively. Yeah. Perfect. So I think that's really important because looking at this is right now, if you look at the C arm, the maximum, maximum, maximum is right from this emission, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's nobody like the, the radiation. Right. So, so also, just... I would stand up back to the back of the room because I don't, I don't have to be in here to get the shot. Because basically, I just want to know where the trial is in the disk space. Looks like we're a little anterior, so we could probably aim it posterior now a little bit for for the rest of it. So, all right, go ahead and go uh, uh, AP again. Yeah. T uh, to uh, Christoph's point, you know, I, I like to navigate these. I, I think Bill mentioned it earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I like to navigate them too. The big question obviously is the cage and the same problem with the expandable cage, right? People just pick a one and then they just crank it up until it, it breaks off instead of like thinking about what they're putting in there. I think to me that's the next step. They really have to think about it. But I would navigate. The other trick you can do if you want to, <coughs> if you're really worried about that, we is switch to the Vizio? Yeah, put thanks. the machine over the top and you can turn it around then and get rid of the emitter on that side. And then it still moves, yeah. But it it, um, it it gets in your way more. So I've tried that too, to do that, and I've just gone back to just na navigating. <clears throat> yeah, well, I think talking about the, you know, cost conscious earlier, you know, is just trying to get the approval from the hospital to, to buy the module for the navigation. So uh, let's go with the seven, uh, seven trial, yeah. They care less for a surgeon occupational hazards, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the camera is great, though. Honestly, I, I really. Uh, yeah, yeah I think the. Uh, let me see that cob one more. Time. Maybe the narrow cob. Yeah, I, I think the the camera makes me like this procedure more because you know at least when I was first doing the procedure, not there. Uh, shot. Oh yeah, it's right through there. Like maybe every other case. So you do one case where you thought, oh man, this is great. Uh, I'll do these all the time. And then you do the next case, you're, you're like, man, what am I thinking? What was I thinking? I'm like torturing myself here. So I think with the camera, basically you're, you're more kind of in that middle part of your difficulty, your learning curve. Uh, here, my... Shot there. Oh. Shot. You know, one thing, Vic, and I, this is just me, it's like, you know, if, if you find yourself too anterior, you've already, already did this work and put the trial on, it's really hard to reposition the posterior. Uh, do you, <laughs> it just do doesn't want to go that way. That's 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 the one issue, but um, I, I'm not sure there's a good solution other than putting a wider implant in sometimes. Well, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, it's the same things that happen when you're doing lateral decubitus um, where you're kind of committed to a tract, uh, especially when you get a trial in. And so I think, um, you know, th that's part of the, the tactile feedback you get from doing a lot of these cases. Um, the, I mean, the image guidance can be helpful um, to kind of orient yourself, but, you know, you still have to kind of be paying attention to what the instruments feel like in your hands and, and things like that. And kind of knowing the potential pitfalls of the, the retractor and things like that, and things like that. All right, so uh, we've done like not a great disc prep, but I think we've got enough where we can put the cage in. And so, um, so just for the sake of time. So uh, it's important here with this particular cage, uh, let's see the camera there. So basically this opens, the anterior part opens up more, so you get lordosis as you open it up. So it's important what orientation you put this in. Um, so anterior is pointing down. So, um, so it goes in at seven millimeters. Shot. Shot there. And the interesting thing with this cage is it actually retracts a little bit. Shot. As you expand it. So you always go past the tip there. Um, the other way you can see it is if you see on the kind of the the closer to where I'm coming from, there's that flat rectangle where there's a little notch there. So that's basically the interface between the inserter and the, and the cage. And so basically you get that lined up to the, um, the lateral border of vertebral body. So go ahead and save that one. So now we're just dialing up with the expansion here. Shut. 
So you can see the cage expanding in place. So again, this is a pretty healthy disk space, so we'll just kind of max it out. Can, can you cut to the x-ray? We, we, we weren't able to see that. Oh yeah, uh, go, ahead, yeah go ahead and show that AP. Yeah, so that's the latest shot. Um, so you can see it expanding. So again, this one will expand out to 14 millimeters in height anteriorly, and you'll get 15 degrees of lordosis there. So let's deploy that. Yeah. It'd be nice to get a lateral view now, but. Uh, so yeah, so we'll get a lateral view here in a second. So why don't you go ahead and go lateral. Uh, yeah, you can do one more shot. So that's it fully expanded. <clears throat> and then we'll see what we get with the retractor. Uh, it might, we might get a better view once we get the retractor out. Um, but yeah, I mean, with, with most of these expandable cages, you, you need some way to backfill the cage. Um, so we're a little anterior, I think, but probably okay. Shot there. Uh, oh, you have that lollipop? Yeah, if you could, I, it looks pretty good, actually, probably. Shot. Okay, yeah, so why don't we just roll toward the feet for a second. I'll pull this retractor out. And then we can get like kind of the final view there. And I think, uh, you know, Bill alluded to this in this talk because you're taking advantage of gravity for the positioning. So, you know, the amount of segmental lordotic restoration that you get with this technique, with, with this approach compared to lateral decubitus, uh, I mean, you can see it. So, all right, why don't you come back and do uh, another lateral view. Yeah, so I think, I think we can live with that in L34. Again, like I said, the, the, this prep's not the greatest in the world just for the sake of time, but um, you know, I, I think where that cage is sitting is, is pretty good. We only had the 18 millimeter available, which I think in this individual worked pretty well. And then um, you know, as far as for with the, the ergonomics of the case, so again, when I first started doing this, I was doing a lot of revision work. So when I was doing the exposure, I would have my assistant uh, resident they would expose the old hardware, um, you know, get things ready there, maybe remove the old hardware. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would start closing uh, the lateral incision and they would kind of finish that work. Uh, and then, um, you know, do an arm spin, put the screws in with the robot, uh, and then just connect it or put new screws in, whatever, whatever the case dictates. Um, you can also use this with a pre-op workflow where, um, uh, oh, do I need to sit, sit down again? Sorry. Uh, you can also use this with a pre-op workflow where you just take fluoro shots, register, merge it to a pre-op CT, place your screws with a robot, uh, and then do your inner body afterward. And so, so that's, that's another, another way to do it as well. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, any, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm real excited to see how, how Bill does this because he's really the master. <laughs> but, uh, but this is kind of what, what, what I've developed in, in my own practice. So uh, happy to take any other questions. Great, Vic. That was a great presentation. It went pretty smoothly and great cage placement, actually. Um, so we're going to move on.